kick this off. Welcome to the 224th regular meeting of the New York Flames Users Group. Tonight we have Armand Dodgar, uh, who will be giving us an introduction to HashiCorp Vault. Uh, I'd first like to say how much we appreciate our sponsor, Digital Ocean, for providing this lovely and emergency space for us. Uh, also pizza and also beer. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure they're hiring, so, you know. Look, look up here. Look up here. All right, thank you. Um, tonight, before we get started, we have our usual requests. Uh, please silence your cell phones. Uh, do not eat any snacks and noisy wrappers during the presentation. Please silence those as well. Um, as usual, we will be recording tonight's meeting and posting it on our YouTube channel uh, within a few weeks. Uh, you can find the link on meetup.com in the comments when it's ready. Um, please save your questions for the end. We'll uh, have some microphones at the front, so if you can form a line and then just pass the mic back to whoever behind you, that would be helpful. Um, we'd also like to thank our past sponsors, including uh, Two Sigma, Bloomberg, IBM, Canonical, Brandor Group, Google, and Pearson for their support. In addition, Dialog would not be able to function without all of our volunteers over the many years uh, who have contributed so greatly. Um, CMO's here if you want to talk to him about workshops uh, that are still happening at the NYU Silver Building, uh, room 512, 32 Beverly Place, uh, next Tuesday, probably. Uh, check the meetup page, uh, should be there from seven, and uh, those are usually from 7 to 9. Uh, the next general meeting will be Thursday, March 28th. Paul Zuchowski will be giving us a talk on ZFS on Linux. Maybe here, maybe upstairs, we're not really sure yet. Check the meetup page. Um, after the presentation, we'll be heading to the Coffee Room Cafe, 359 West Broadway, two blocks east of here to keep talking and hang out. Um, final reminder, silence your cell phones, put away the wrappers, use the mics for questions, and now to introduce our speaker. Armin, Armin has a passion for distributed systems and their application to real-world problems. He's a founder and CTO of HashiCorp, where he brings distributed systems into the world of DevOps tooling. He has worked on Nomad, Vault, Terraform, Console, and Surf at HashiCorp, and maintains the StatSite and BloomD OSS projects. Please welcome Armin Dengar, giving us an introduction to HashiCorp Hall. Thank you for the organizers for putting all this together, DigitalOcean for hosting us uh, last minute. Cool, so today I wanted to do sort of an introduction to Vault. Uh, I guess we can sort of skip by uh, my intros. I feel like uh, sort of got that. Uh, so you guys know me, I'm Armand. If there's any questions, or, you know, please feel free, just ping me. I'm Armand everywhere, you'll find me uh, relatively easily. For those of you who aren't maybe familiar with HashiCorp or maybe just know a Vault or, or maybe one of the other tools, super briefly, that kind of HashiCorp mission is how do we help you automate application delivery, right? And so whether you're running an application on-premise, in the cloud, all of the clouds, you know, and some combination of those things, you know, that's sort of our general focus area. And so as we sort of talk about that problem space, in our view, there's kind of four discrete layers, four discrete problems, right? One is how do we think about provisioning infrastructure, right? So day one, how do we go from you know, nothing to something? Day two, how do we sort of manage the life cycle of this infrastructure? Day end, how do we take things out of commission? And our big focus there is Terraform. Uh, then the layer above is how do we think about security, right? Both infrastructure security, application security, data security, and that's where our focus is Vault. So we'll spend a little bit more time tonight on that. Then above that is how do we kind of connect all these pieces together, right? So when we talk about the networking of our different pieces of infrastructure, how do we connect all of our you know, microservices together, you know, our web server has a discover and route to our database, that kind of problem is really the focus of the console, right? So it's a service discovery tool that really focuses on how do we have a central registry of what's running where, and then use that for service discovery, automation of log bouncers and firewalls, and then going all the way to things like service mesh and doing you know, mutual TLS for authentication. And then the final layer is the runtime, right? What do we use as developers you know, to develop and run our end application? Our focus there is Nomad, which is our application scheduler, right? So make it easy, developers can specify the job files, submit it to Nomad, and then you know, we'll launch it, manage it, babysit applications. 
So it's sort of a bunch there. Uh, today I want to spend more time talking about Vault, but if you're interested in any of the stuff, check out you know, learn.hashicorp or Hashicorp's homepage. Okay, so zooming out a little bit, before we really get to the weeds of Vault, right, what are the sort of use cases we're talking about? Right. I think when we talk about Vault, you know, we nebulously put it in the security category. There's a whole lot of security tools, everything from you know, static code analysis all the way through to you know, HSM devices. So you know, specifically, the few problems we're talking about when we talk about Vault is one is secret management. Right? If that doesn't mean anything, we'll get to it in a second. Really think about credentials, usernames, passwords, API keys, certificates, things like that. The other is encryption as a service, right? How do we actually protect data, right? End application data, credit cards, addresses, social security. If we're processing that stuff, how do application developers process that, store it, secure that kind of information? And then the last part of it is more around privilege access management. So if I'm a developer and I need access to a production database, how do I get credentials, right? Or if, I'm, if it's an application that maybe needs access to a database, how does it check in and get that type of access? So that's what we mean as sort of that privileged access is things that necessarily don't want to be everyone in your company, but select people, select applications should have access to get to those credentials. So this is kind of falls in this, you know, the first few use cases really fall into this much broader category of secret management, right? And so when we talk about secret management, I think the sort of first piece of context that's useful to have is what is a secret, right? What are we talking about when we're talking about managing secrets? It's really anything that you might use to authenticate against an end system or that could help you authorize access, right? So in this case, like a username password that I provide to a database is authenticating me, it's authorizing me to query data out of the database. Similarly, if I'm using an API token to you know, Amazon or a TLS certificate that's proving my identity as you know, bankofamerica.com, right? That piece of information is allowing me to authorize myself, right? So any of that type of material, you want to consider secret because any access to it allows whoever now has it to do that authentication, to do that authorization, to have that credential. Right? Sensitive information is closely related, but different in the sense it doesn't grant you access to things. Right? So credit card information, social security information, any type of PII, that's sensitive. Right? You don't want to leak it. You don't want to lose that information. But I can't log into the database with the customer social security. Right? So in that sense, it's not authorizing or authenticating. Right, so that, that's the kind of distinction to make. The reason it's useful to make this distinction is there's orders of magnitude difference between how much of these things you have. Right? So secret material, maybe you have 1,000, 10,000, if you're an enormous organization, 100,000 pieces of secret material versus you know, sensitive material, you could have billions, you know, trillions of records depending on the business here. Right? So the orders of magnitude are very different and how you would manage them is, is very different right, as a result. So the kind of questions that we ask when we're talking about secret management, like the things we'd like to have good answers for, right, are things like, how do our applications get their secrets? Right? I deploy a web server. How does its web server get the database credential? Right? How do the humans do it? Right? I have a database administrator. How do they get access to the database password? Right? How do we update these things? We need to rotate the database credential. What does that process look like? Right? If that thing is leaked, how do we revoke access to the database? Right? Then it's like, if there was a leak and we need to debug it, do we understand when credentials were used, by whom, where? Right? Do we have an audit trail? Can we answer those kind of questions? And all that really you know, leads up to sort of the penultimate question. It's like, what's our break last? Right? If there is a compromise, what are we supposed to do? Right? What's the run book of rotate the secret, audit who did it, you know, yada, yada. Right? And ideally, we have good answers to all of these sort of questions. Right? If we do, then we're in sort of a very mature place from a secret management standpoint. That's not where I'd say most organizations are, right? So when we look at sort of the state of the world, uh, the, what we sort of refer to it as is secret sprawl, right? You see that the secret material is sort of sprawled, you know, all over the estate, right? It's hard coded in source code, it's in plain text in GitHub, it's in our config files, it's in Chef and Puppet and Ansible, it's just all over the place, right? And so there's this huge decentralization of key material, right? There's nowhere I can go to say, what are all my secret material? who's accessed it, you know, what's the controls around it. We have very little visibility even where these credentials are, let alone how they're being accessed. And so all this really leads to we have a very poorly, if defined at all, break class. Right? If we had a procedure of like what to do if the database credentials were leaked, mostly it probably looks like you know, go to indeed.com and look for another job. Right? <laughs> yeah, that's a procedure. <laughs> So, you know, with that, that sort of like sets the context, uh, I think, of like, what's the problem we're really trying to solve with Vault, right? 
you know, at the first, the sort of top level goal is how do you get to a single source of truth for secrets, right? It's sort of the inversion of the sprawl problem, right? We want total centralization as opposed to sort of total dispersal that we have today, right? So for that to work, you have to acknowledge that there's two very different access patterns, right? One is going to be automated programmatic applications and infrastructure, right? If I'm building sort of a CI CD pipeline and I need to distribute secrets to my applications, that's all going to be programmatic. Right? So that's a very different access path than people. Right? If I'm a database administrator, I'm not going to authenticate the same way. I'm not going to interact with the system in the same way. I'm going to have the same regularity. Right? And so operator access is going to be very manual, very different looking than sort of our central systems. Right? But we want these to be converged. Otherwise, what you'll inevitably get is, well, I'll put it for the CI CD system in vault, but then we'll just you know, put it in our wiki system you know, for everyone else. And you're like, okay, well, now you've defeated the whole purpose. The other side of this is how do we have practical security? And what I mean by that is, you know, all security goes through this sort of fundamental trade-off between usability and sort of theoretical security, right? The most theoretically secure system is a nightmare to use, right? By definition, right? You're going to handle every single edge case. You're going to make it, you know, every aspect of the system so painful because every one of those things serves a function in terms of making it more secure, right? So there is this middle ground that you want to find that's what's secure enough but also practical enough that people will use it and not try and circumvent it because the system's so annoying. Right? And then the other side of it is modern data center friendly, which is really just another way of saying it should run on the cloud. Right? If you need dedicated hardware appliances, or you can't handle automated failover, or the system doesn't really scale well, right? it's not very friendly to sort of how we think about modern data centers. So if those are the goals, right? then we sort of back into that some of the key features of right? The most basic kind of table stakes thing, as you would imagine for a system like Vault, is just secure secret storage, right? It's an encrypted key value locker, right? I can write keys to it that are encrypted, I can read keys that are encrypted, right? And there's sort of sane security around that, so we'll talk about that in a second, but that's table stakes, right? Then you get into some of the more fancy capabilities, right? How do we move away from static credentials and instead make these things sort of ephemeral, time bounded, and sort of constantly rolling, right? That's sort of the idea behind dynamic secrets, we'll talk about that. And then what are the mechanisms we need to be able to do things like revocation, to be able to do things like rotation, right? Start needing to get into some more sophistication with things like leasing. So we'll talk about that. Uh, and then things like audit logging, rich access controls, multiple ways for different clients to authenticate against the system because your machines and apps are going to authenticate very differently than your end users. Right? So as we're kind of doing this, right, there's a core set of security principles that we also want to apply. And when we look at security, what's interesting about it is, in some sense, there's nothing new, right? The principles that we knew were the good ideas in you know, the 70s and 60s are still the same good ideas, right? It's at the core of it all is you know, the acronym of CIA, right? You want confidentiality of the material it's storing. You want to ensure the integrity of it. You can detect if tampering takes place. You want the system to be available right, under different failure modes. Uh, otherwise, that itself is a security risk. But then you want to optimize for things like least privilege, right? You don't want to give access to credentials if you don't need access, the sort of need to know basis type of thing, right? You want privilege separation, right? So the person who can maybe administer policy on the system should also not have access necessarily to read secrets out of it, right? You want things like privilege bracketing. Just because I give you access temporarily doesn't mean you should have access forever, right? You want non repudiation, meaning I have a strong trail that tells me I know exactly who did what when in a way that's very hard for someone to be like, no, actually, I didn't do that and deny it, right? And you want defense in depth. You have to assume any given security control will fail. And so you want multiple overlapping security controls so that if any one does fail, hopefully there's other ones that will catch the issue, right? So when we talk about kind of the baseline feature, it's just being a secure bit locker, effectively, right? I write data to it. The data is encrypted in transit on the way to Vault. It's encrypted at rest when Vault stores it in storage. Right? And this is sort of state of the art, you know, 256 bit AES, GCM mode, right? All done in software. And the goal here is that I don't need specialized hardware, no HSNs, nothing like that. And what this is providing is confidentiality and integrity. Right? If there's tampering happening on the wire or tampering happening in storage, you're going to be able to detect that. And it's confidential, right? You can't listen in on TLS traffic, you can't sort of unpack what Vault is storing at rest. Everything's encrypted, right? It's kind of the first baseline. And so, what does this look like, right? Here's a simple CLI example, right? So, Vault has kind of a hierarchical file system type layout. So, in this case, secret is sort of a directory. We're writing to path secret foo, foo being belief. Now, we're writing some opaque value, bar is vacant, right? Vault doesn't really care it's in the sense of it being a key value store, so you can write whatever you want, right? 
So we can do a write of that data, we can come back, we can do a read of that data, and we see, get the same data back. Right? We don't have to think as we're interacting with it about encrypting all the wire or arrest or things like that. That's sort of just happening as we would expect it to. And okay, so if that's sort of baseline, right? That's, that's sort of uninteresting in some sense. I think where you start getting more interesting is when we talk about how do we move away from static credentials, right? We don't want credentials that are static and exist for very long periods of time. And the reason for that is at the end of the day, we're giving these credentials out to incredibly unreliable actors, right? And what I mean by that is both the people and applications are equally bad, right? Our applications are probably worse. The first thing they'll do when they get the credential is log out their configuration, right? They'll say, like, here's how I've been configured with my database username and password, and they'll ship that on off to Swan, right? The second thing they'll do is the moment you get some 500 error in the rendering, they'll be like, here's all my environment variables and configuration, including the database username and password. They'll present that to your users, right? Or if there's an exception, it'll capture that trace back and ship it off to Sentry or some other trace monitoring system, and it'll include all the relevant contacts, including username and password. So what you find is these applications are basically just a sieve, right? They're just leaking credentials all over the place. Right? And then people have a tendency to avoid security mechanisms, right? So it's like, ah, I have to log into Vault and browse and get my credential. That's kind of annoying. I'm just going to do it one time and then put it on my desktop, right? And passwords.txt, right? And so, you know, how do you start to mitigate the fact that you have to give these credentials out? The end system needs to use it, right? There's no escaping that. But that the end systems or users uh, tend to work against you. Right? The goal is move away from it being a static credential and time bound how long it's valid. Right? In some sense, the ultimate goal would be it's a one time pin. You can use this credential literally once, connect to your database, and that's useful. Right? One time pin is a little impractical for most arrangements. It's relatively uh, intolerant to, to any sort of downtime, uh, as you'd imagine. So, something in the middle around, you know, do I have credentials that are valid for an hour, maybe a day, maybe a week, depending on what my sort of thresholds are? But that becomes the goal. Is find some sweet spot that is not, it's valid forever or it's valid once. So the core of how Vault does this is this notion of a dynamic secret. Right? When you ask Vault for a dynamic secret, what it's doing is generating you one that's unique to you as a client, and it's leasing it to you. It's saying this is valid for the next 24 hours. At the end of your lease, there's no guarantee this thing is valid. Right? And so what this lets Vault do is two things. One, Vault is tracking all that metadata. It has all these leases about what have we issued, which clients have what credentials. And so part of it is, if there's a breach, we know, hey, MySQL's been, you know, the credentials on Twitter, right? We can go to Vault and say, hey, all of the leases associated with MySQL, go revoke those right now, right? Go purge all of those credentials and cycle them. Right? So this gives us some way to start thinking about break glass procedure. The other thing it lets us do against less sort of disaster scenarios is detect when we have bad integrations, right? An app that isn't properly integrated, that doesn't respect the contract of the lease, it'll work for the first 24 hours, and then it'll break, right? And so this gives us a certain enforceability, right? You sort of ensure that the clients are sort of correctly implemented. And what this gives you is assurance that when I want to do things like rotation, right? I actively want to say, hey, I have a policy that I rotate every 30 days. You know that the apps are actually doing the rotation, right? They're not holding on to some old credential and refusing to rotate. So if they do, they're just kind of right, right? In a very relatively quick way. And so what this starts to let us do is get to that goal of never priming root credentials to clients, right? We don't want to give the MySQL root credential. We don't want to give Amazon IAM tokens out, right? But at the same time, the clients need some level of access to these systems, right? So we'll scope down by role and only generate a dynamic credential that's restricted to what they need to do. So we might say, hey, that web server only needs a credential that can read from S3. There's no reason it needs to write. There's no reason it needs to delete will only generate a time bound token that has read permission, right? Or similarly, maybe we have a billing system that only needs read access to a database. It doesn't need to be able to write, right? And so the fact that we have these generated on demand means that we don't have to manage a whole ton of different credentials. We don't need to know for every account, go create a database credential and manage 500 different database passwords and rotate them on a monthly basis. We give Vault a single root credential, and we define a series of roles, and on demand, Vault will generate them as needed. It will make them unique per client. And what that gives us is that non-repudiation. Right? Now we have a unique audit trail. So if when we see that credential shows up on Twitter or you know, a forum or something, we know only web server 47 had that credential and only during this time period. Right? It helps us to try and sort of understand and pinpoint the point of compromise. Versus when I have 500 servers all using the same credential, the point of compromise could be any one of those 500. Right? There's no really way to know. 
So what does this kind of look like as a high level flow? It looks something like this, right? So an end user, this could be a person, could be a, you know, an application machine, requests a credential from Vault. Vault then goes out and talks to the endpoint system, right? I use database as an example, but you could fill in that as being Active Directory, that could be AWS, that could be you know, you know, a messaging queue like Kafka, right? An endpoint system that has some sort of sub-credentialing creates a dynamic sub-credential generates an audit request to associate that credential with that request of user, and then returns that credential back to the user. Right? So that's what the high-level flow is. And so these backends, these dynamic secrets, are designed to be pluggable with all, right? So today, there's sort of a growing list of these things. Almost any sort of traditional SQL system you could think of, all the major cloud providers, messaging queues, things like that are all integrated. And the goal of these plugins are really tiny, right? Like an average database integration of maybe 150 lines of code in Vault. So if you have some custom internal system or something that's not yet supported by Vault, this is not a heavy lift, right? You basically need to teach Vault, how do I create an account? How do I delete an account? How do I check the status of an account? And you can write that as a plugin in an hour, right? And so there's support for these things sort of constantly growing with every version of Vault. Part of the design is that these things are implemented in a way that sort of arms length from the core of Vault. So the goal, going back to defense and depth, is we don't even trust ourselves as you know, the maintainers of all. Right? It's like if we introduce a bug in this plugin, we don't want that to somehow be able to compromise some of the larger security of the vault system. Right? So that's why they're specifically plugins that are kept out of process, they're kept sort of arm's length from vault core, so that if there's some issue in these things, that doesn't lead to sort of a broader compromise in the system. And so, you know, why leasing, right? It seems like a complicated system. Clients have to know to check in, and you know, they have to periodically rotate. But the goal is it really gives us all of these things, right? Like that complexity is essential for this trade off, right? Which is now we actually have some privileged bracketing. We can time down how long a credential is valid for. We have non repudiation. We know for each client a unique credential that they can't say, no, I didn't have that thing. It bounds how long a secret update takes versus something like key value, where we say, Great, we changed the database password and key value. How often does the client check in for an update? You know, maybe the next time it's deployed, right? So it becomes an unbounded delay, right? Uh, versus a lease is a very bounded update and enables revocation early, right? So all of these are kind of the trade off for accepting that complexity of by doing the lease and doing this periodic sort of refresh, we kind of gain all these benefits. Then there's sort of classic security bread and butter, right? So, Clients have to be able to authenticate against the system, right? So if a web server comes up, before it can request a credential, it has to first be authenticated, right? Vault has to know it's a web server, not just some random thing talking to it. So there's a series of authentication mechanisms that are more oriented to applications and machines, right? Things like presenting a certificate, bearer tokens, we have a mechanism called app roll, <laughs> native integrations with things like you know, AWS, Azure, Kubernetes, Pivotal Cloud Foundry, et cetera. There's these platform-based integrations that allow us to authenticate the end application, right? So AWS is a great example, right? When the web server gets booted by Amazon, it's provided sort of a dynamic IAM token. That token is the one that gets provided to Vault to say, hey, I'm a web server. And then Vault is able to go back and talk to Amazon and say, tell me about this token, right? Tell me what region it's in, what account it is, what VPC, what AMI, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then it can check that and say, okay, if it's AMI, XYZ, and account ABC, then we know that thing's a web server, right? So we can authenticate that, yes, this thing actually is what it claims it is, it's not just some random thing running on the network, right? And then similar type mechanism you can imagine for something like Kubernetes or you know, other platforms. The other sort of mode is our human operators, right? Our human operators are not gonna present us IAM tokens or TLS certificates. They're gonna wanna use things like a username, password, and log in against LDAP or Active Directory or do some sort of single sign-on, maybe with like GitHub, right? So these are different pluggable authentication modules that allow Vault to support sort of a broad range of different platforms and integrations. So that's what you would expect, right? Many different integration points, those are also little plugins. So if you have some custom thing, it's not hard to plug in a different auth scope. Now where Vault tries to pull it in and standardize things is how we talk about authorization, right? So authentication is just saying, yes, we have a strong assertion of your web server versus you being a database, right? We've authenticated you. But authorization is really that policy mapping of what is a web server allowed to do, right? What is a database allowed to do, right? What is ARMON allowed to do, right? And so the authorizations are common across all the different backends, And so it's the same language, the same way you specify the rules of who can do what, whether they're authenticating as a Kubernetes app or an LDAP user or something running on Azure, right? It's all the same, right? 
By default, uh, Vault operates on a total default deny need to know basis, right? This is getting back to that privilege of least privilege, right? So if I log in as Armin and I haven't been explicitly granted access to anything, great, that's about all I can do. I can log into Vault, and then I can ask Vault, am I logged in, right? Beyond that, I can't access any secrets, I can't do anything until I'm explicitly authorized to have that access. And then on an auditing side, everything that happens against Vault, request and response gets audited. Right? And the system has sort of a failed closed design. So you can enable multiple different auditing backends. I can say send it to syslog, send it to Splunk, send it to file system. And if all of them fail, Vault can't get an audit trail out, it'll refuse the request. Right? And the reason it'll do that is you don't want to end up in that non-repudiation case where I, a malicious operator, say, you know, just turn off Splunk for a few minutes, pull out a whole bunch of secrets when Vault can't audit it, and then turn it back on. Right? And you just have this gap in the audit period where the system stayed open, even though there's really no way for it to build an audit trail. Right? So that fail closes an important part of the, the non-repudiation design. So as you might imagine, a system like this uh, ends up being very, very sensitive in terms of its uptime, right? If Vault is down for an extended period of time and it happens to broker access to databases and certificates and everything else that your applications need, uh, the data center won't stay running for very long. Uh, and so it has, by design, from the very initial release, uh, sort of a hot active standby model, right? So you can run multiple copies of it, one is active at any given time. If it falls over, they'll elect another leader and fail over, right? So that you can run any number of them that you need to get to sort of your availability guarantee, right? Typically, you're running, you know, two or three of them. If you're paranoid, you might run five of them. Uh, but it's really about that balance of, of availability that you want to achieve. As you start talking about multiple data centers, you don't want to have traffic from, you know, data center east coming back to data center west to get credentials. Because otherwise, what happens if data center west goes down, or I lose the WAN link, or some sort of latency interruption, right? All of a sudden, even though I have multiple data centers, realistically, they're one failure domain. If I lose volume one, I've lost both data centers, right? So in practice, what you want to do is replicate the data between multiple sites and avoid cross-WAN traffic, right? If I'm in the west, I talk to the west wall. If I'm in east, I talk to the east wall. Uh, and that follows from a primary, secondary replication. So one of the interesting challenges about operating a system like Vault is the sort of classic chicken and egg, right? Which is, okay, Vault encrypts data at rest, so when you boot Vault, how does it read its own data, right? It needs to have the keying material to decrypt Vault, so where does that come from, right? One option would be you put it in the config file, and then your problem is, okay, well, that config file is inevitably managed by Chef, which is inevitably then, you know, the configs live in GitHub, so you put your master key in GitHub and basically defeat the whole point of the system. Right, I put the main key back into version control. So what Vault forces you to do is it actually doesn't let you put its key in a config file. It must be provided to the system online. Right? When Vault starts, it starts in a sealed state. Right? It comes online and says, great, I can see that I have data. I don't have my key though. I don't know how to get to it. Right? Now that I'm running, you can give me my master key. You can unseal it, and then it'll be able to proceed and decrypt that data. Well, the problem is that master key that you would give Vault is now the key to the kingdom. Right? If I have to give that key to someone and say, hey, when Vault comes online, give that to it, you know, you'd say, well, why should I even bother? Right? I'll just take this master key, go to the Vault data at rest, decrypt it, and take whatever I want, and bypass all the access controls. Right? You know, as an added bonus, that won't even be an out of block. Right? And so this master key is super, super sensitive. Right? You need to sort of provide it to Vault for Vault to be able to function, but having this key would let you decrypt all of it without going through it. Right? So we need to be able to protect against that sort of insider attack having some trusted person attack the storage. And so the way Vault solves this is by following the sort of two-man rule. It's sort of like classic, you know, think uh, Hunt for Red October type of thing. Right? So the way it works is there's the kind of main encryption keys that Vault uses to actually protect all the data within the system, right? And there's many different encryption keys so the Vault can kind of rotate constantly. But all the encryption keys are ultimately protected by a single master key, right? You can rekey the master key, but at any given time there's only one. But what we do is we split that master key into n different shares, n different parts, as they're called. Right? And now you can distribute these parts to any number of key holders. Right? I could have 10, 20, whatever, 50. And each of these shares on their own are useless. Right? The share doesn't tell me anything about the master key. It doesn't help me sort of decrypt it. It doesn't help me attack the encryption keys. It's relatively a useless thing until a threshold T is met. Right? And N and T are both configurable. To fall out of the box, fall it goes with 3 out of 5. Right? So I can split the master key into these five parts, distribute those shares to different people, and anytime all needs to be unsealed, some quorum of the keys needs to come back, right? 
So you can ping your you know, key holder and say, hey, you know, do the vault unseal. Any three that are provided can be recombined and vault will regenerate the master key, right? Anything less than that threshold is still useless, right? So even if you have two bad insiders, you know, two shares doesn't help you, right? You need to get to that magic third one, right? And so the goal here is really that privilege separation. Right? So I don't want the person who's my key holder to have any sort of implied privilege, any sort of implied administrative capability with the vault. Right? Otherwise, whoever is a key holder is like a super admin in my organization. Right? So this is where that you get that sort of hunt for Red October, right? Multiple people inserting and turning the key before you can initiate sort of a nuclear launch. It comes out of that same sort of two-man notion. The other feature that sort of landed more recently in vault is what we call cloud unseal, right? Cloud auto unseal. Right? And the goal here is, you know, I still have the core encryption keys, I still have the master key, but what if I don't want to do this manual unseal process, right? It turns out it's sort of hard to automate these types of un uh, unseals. And so what you can do is say, you know what, I actually trust the underlying cloud provider to be my key holder, right? I'm going to use their underlying KMS system, right, whether it's key vault, KMS, et cetera, right? And say, they're going to hold on to the root key that is then used to protect my master key, which is used to protect the encryption key, so on and so forth. So Vault can integrate with us and use one of those keys. So that when Vault boots, if it's configured to use an auto unseal, they'll interact with the cloud's key management system, unseal itself automatically, and kind of move on with the process. Right? So there's a choice here, and it really depends on kind of like how do you think about the risk exposure, right? If you trust the underlying platform and you trust the sort of controls you have around the, the sort of key management system, uh, you can automate it. If you say, you know what, we're either on premise, if you're on-premise, you can use an HSN, but you know maybe you're on-premise or you really don't want to give away you know, the auto-unseal capability, uh, you might hold on to it and do a manual unseal process. Just kind of the high-level summary of Vault's core is what it's trying to do is solve that sprawl problem. Right? How do we go from the stuff that lives everywhere, we have very little visibility, very little access control, right, to a place that's centralized, we have tight authentication, authorization, and auditing around all of it. And then we have two different problems to worry about, right? As we do that, we need to worry about insider threat, right? which is actually more real than outsider threat. And that really comes through a combination of secret sharing, that sort of splitting of the key, as well as the tight access control system and minimizing privilege people have. And then we need to protect against external threat. And that's really about having a strong crypto system in terms of how we protect that rest and transit. Right? And really, we want to apply the sort of core security principles throughout all of this. Right? So that's the heart of secret management. Now the other use case we talked about was thinking about data protection, right? And really sort of this notion of encryption as a service. Right? And so this is really where sensitive data starts to come in, right? So secret data, you know, vaults, core, you can either put it in as a key value, you can use things like dynamic secrets, and those form the basis of how you do secret management and protect secret data. But we have a whole lot of sensitive data to deal with as well, right? And the challenge we have is kind of two things. One, cryptography is hard, right? Uh, you know, I think it's you know famously you know probably one of the hardest things to get right because it's so a the jargon is impenetrable and b it's sort of like a, you know get any one part of this thing wrong and you the whole system's broken, right? And so you know my favorite anecdote of this is you know the one password app. You know I use it on my phone, I use it on my laptop, right? I'm sure many of you use it, right? It's a keychain manager. You know, if you're unfamiliar, it's like any other key ring. Right? You have a master key, it holds onto your other password. Right? So this is an app that does literally one thing. Right? You go to master key and encrypts a file of other things. Security researcher finally looked at this thing, and it turned out they don't set the initialization factor to anything but zero. Right? Which is great until you've encrypted like four things in it, at which point you can reverse out the master key right? and decrypt it without needing to know the password. And so you know, the, the example here is not that you know, people don't make mistakes and there's always bugs. Right? Like, that's always going to happen to all of us. Right? Well, it's no exception. But the, you know, here's an app that had literally one job which was an encrypt one file. And then you say, okay, well, how many of our average developers are good enough at cryptography to get this right when the application's main job is not cryptography, right? It probably is doing some other thing and that's some small subsection of it. It needs to do some crypto, right? And the answer is vanishingly few. I think we'll get this right. And even if we get that right, right, it turns out actually the crypto is the easy part, right? There's actually a lot of really good libraries out there that are opinionated and do the right things and sort of avoid the foot gunning of most cryptography. It turns out the harder part is key management, right? How do you actually distribute keys? How do you rotate keys? How do you version them? How do you manage the life cycle of keys? And you're like, if you then look at the number of apps that get the key management right, that goes from vanishingly few to like zero, basically, right? because it's very, very challenging. So how do we start to help developers with so this is really kind of the idea that's spun into what Vault today calls the transit backend, which is how do we help by only seeing data in transit, right? 
And you can't store all the sensitive data in vault. If you try to write a billion records, it'll fall over, right? So instead, can we flow this data through vault, just in transit, and use vault to sort of do the cryptography for us, right? The goal being you define a series of named keys, right? I can have my credit card key and my PII key and my log key, etc. And Vault will generate a high value key for you but never return it. Right? The application never sees it and never leaves Vault, right? But instead will expose a series of APIs, right? Encrypt, decrypt, sign, verify, rewrap, re-encrypt, all of the kind of classic things that you might want, like logical operations, right? And then an application calls a signature that's basically encrypt with the credit card key with this data, and I get cycle right? The app doesn't say, am I using AES or triple DES? It doesn't say 128-bit or 256. It doesn't say, you know, what's my chaining mode? Any of that stuff. It just says, encrypt with this key, here's some data, right? Decrypt with this key, here's some data, right? So the signature is meant to focus on the logical operation, not the sort of details of how it's implemented. And so this gives Vault <coughs> a whole lot of leeway in terms of how it wants to implement it, right? So if AES 256 becomes no longer the standard and all of us need to move to 512, great. We'll release a new version of Vault that changes the defaults. That method signature will be the same, but now just magically it's using a different cipher and no one's lending any license, right? So this gives us crypto agility, is what that's referred to as, right? So as the standards change, right? They change all, change all the time, right? Like SHA-1 used to be a standard, now that's deprecated, we're moving on to SHA-2, right? Shortly that'll be deprecated, we'll move on to SHA-3, right? So these things happen, and you kind of constantly have to be doing that, but it's very, very hard if the application hard codes and says, I'm doing a SHA-1 and I depend on the specifics of that behavior, right? Because now it's very hard to deprecate SHA. So the goal here is our application should never have access to underlying keys, so they can't actually leak it. But we want a decoupling of the encryption and the controls from the storage. Right? So we can talk to Vault and have Vault do the encryption, but then we can go store it in our favorite scale-out store that can handle a billion records, right? Cassandra, DynamoDB, Postgres, right? whatever. We've decoupled the encryption and access control from the actual scale-out storage, right? which we know how to do well. So what this looks like at a high level flow is usually something like this, right? The end user, let's say, provides us with a credit card or some other sensitive information. Our web application sends that plain text to Vault, says, hey, please encrypt this with a key. Vault, if we're authorized and authenticated and actually allowed to do an encrypt with that key, we'll do the operation and generate an audit trail for it, and then hand the ciphertext back to the app. The app will then store the ciphertext in the database. Right? So now if there's a compromise of our database, someone's able to get to a you know, select star for customers, what they're going to get back is a whole bunch of encrypted data, right? nothing useful. Right? Now if they want to really be able to get to it, they either need to compromise Vault to get it to give it the keys, or they need to be able to elevate to some you know, permission level role that has enough access to mass Vault to do a decryption. They have to stay on our network and talk to Vault and ask it to do a row by row decrypt. Right? So the attack becomes much more sophisticated now to be able to get access to this data versus you know, I found plain text hard coded credentials to the database that never rotate, connected to the database and downloaded plain text data. Right, not very difficult. And so some of the kind of core use cases that we see for this is things like, you know, how do we move things like password management logic out of apps, right? You know, apps tend to do a bad job of this in terms of, you know, we see it all the time of, oh, we, you know, we hashed the password, but hey, did you consult it? Did you use an MD5, right? Did you actually do it in sort of a proper form versus just tell Vault to deal with this thing and just have Vault do the HMACing for you, right? Encryption of sensitive data, outsourcing, signing of service-to-service -service requests, so kind of an emerging pattern, is use job tokens, right? So when my web server makes a call to my API server, it's going to include a job that says, hey, I'm a web server and this thing is signed to prove that I should be able to make this call. Well, to make a system like that work, you need a signing authority, you need a thing that's signing and distributing jobs that everyone trusts and says, can go back to and say, give me your public key signature, right? So that the API can verify the validity of it. So you can actually use Vault as that sort of a signing server, right? It will act as sort of central authority, web server boots, it gets its signed shot, maybe it rotates it every 15 minutes, and then it can pass that around as it makes different API requests. You can have that decentralized sort of authorization. Right? So that's a common pattern. And then other things are like data keys for very large objects, right? So if I'm gonna encrypt a you know, five gigabyte file, I don't wanna flow that over the network to and from Vault, right? I'm gonna implode the mix. So instead what you can do is what are referred to as data keys. Right? You can have Vault generate a high value key and wrap it and protect it, the key that only Vault owns. Right? So you start getting into, you know, there, there's keys upon keys when you get into security. But you have what's called a data encrypted key, which protects the actual data. And you're wrapping that with a key encrypted key, which is encrypting the data encrypted key. Right? Uh, it's, it's less complex than it seems. But anyways, you see a Vault will hold onto the key encrypted key and hand out these data encrypted keys 
And then you can use those in your application to protect these huge files without having to transit back and forth over a network and kill your things. So that's really about data at rest, right? If we're encrypting our data and then writing it to a database, what we're really worried about is like, what if you can get access to that data as it's at rest in the database? What about data that's in transit? Right? It's going over the internet, it's going over you know, in our data centers, right? It's moving between services. And the sort of gold standard here has been TLS, right? When you think about what underpins all of the internet, it's TLS. So, you know, I think we're starting to see the need to start protecting this within our data center. Right? Whether you look at sort of common breaches, right? if you're looking at Target, and even Marcus, things like that, the Google Aurora hacks, right? we're starting to see this sort of shift in mindset around how we think about data centers, which is, I have four walls, and my perimeter is sort of impenetrable, so I don't have to worry about the security on the inside, to, you know, actually the perimeter is a little leakier than we thought, right? and the odds are good a motivated attacker will eventually get into this network. Right? And so as you shift that mindset to, you know, my perimeter isn't 100% effective, it's 90, 80, 50, you know, pick a number, percent effective, you start to care more about things like protecting data even within your data centers. Right? Now the challenge with this historically has always been PKI is a pain, right? You know, the average life cycle of a certificate is probably five years, 10 years, you know, something that's longer than your average employee tenure, is the way I put it, right? And that's for a very specific reason, like nobody wants to deal with certificate life cycle, right? Rotation is a pain, generation is a pain, all that stuff sucks. So how do we do slightly better at this, right? The goal with Vault as a PKI authority is that it can act as an internal CA. Right? So Vault can either have a signing root, you can have a signing intermediate if you have an offline root or you know, a more fancy PKI setup. But what you can now have is an API for signing or generating lease certificates. So I can define roles and say, you know, www.hashgroup.com, api.hashgroup.com, you know, database.hashgroup.com. These are roles. And any time the database wants, it can come up, grab a certificate, and vault the sign and generate it for it. Right? And so instead of generating these things statically and then trying to vault them and every 10 years trying to rotate them, you say, yeah, forget about it. The only thing we store is one signing certificate that can generate new certificates, and then we just mint these things on demand. Right? As a result, we move away from them living forever. Right? You don't have them live for five years or 10 years. Right? You have vault users that do it for every 15 minutes. Right? And you move away from these super long list certs. The reason that's super important is revoking these things is a nightmare, right? In practice, like very few people even track all the certificates they've issued. So even if they wanted to revoke it, they couldn't, right? And on the other side, very few TLS implementations check for revocation, right? The whole revocation ecosystem is like horribly broken. Right? So realistically, what ends up happening is if that certificate is lost for the next five years, ten years, whoever has that certificate just has open access to authentic data that service. Versus if you move to sort of a 15 minute, 30 minute, 24 hour, whatever interval, right? Well, A, Vault will track the certificate because it actually does maintain a certificate of application less, so it will actually do that for you. And for apps that do check it, great. But for apps that don't check it, we're now time bound to a much, much, much smaller period of time. So this enables a few kind of different key use cases, right? One is it allows all of our services to have, you know, these certificates that identify the service in a stronger or adopted way. And this becomes an enabler of things like mutual TLS, right? And so this will allow us to get to sort of end-to-end -end encryption even within our data center so we don't have to worry about data in transit between these different services. It also ends up being kind of the core underpinning as we talk about sort of the next generation of things like service mesh, right? If you've heard of that uh, sort of term, buzzword, right? Uh, you know, at the heart of that, what it really comes down to is certificate generation, distribution, mutual TLS between these nodes. So you've got to get really good, it turns out, at doing search generation. And so certificates with Vault are really just like any other dynamic secret, right? Like you can revoke them, there's leases associated with them. The goal is to never expose those signing keys, just like you know, with the database. And they're tied back to the same ACL system, they're tied back to the same audit trail of access. So part of the kind of theme, hopefully, here is that part of what we're trying to do with Vault is give you the sort of common security substrate, right? You have a common way to authenticate, to authorize, to audit things. And then there's different security capabilities you might light up on top, right? Anything from read a static secret to dynamic secrets to encrypt as a service to PKI as a service to et cetera, et cetera, right? It's sort of a platform in that sense, right? So that's a lot of like vault in theory, right? Like uh, what does vault in practice look like? <coughs> At the heart, the system is a pretty simple, restful API, right? See, it serves sort of JSON over HTTPS. Um, CLI and the UI are really just wrappers around the API. There really is only one front door to the system, which is the API. 
So the CLI is just a client, the UI is just a client of the API. Uh, there's a Terraform provider for it, which is also just a client of the API. So that's the one front door. There's many different ways software might interact with it, right? Our applications are probably doing it programmatically with API. Our you know, human users are probably using CLI and UI. If we're using sort of an infrastructure as code approach to management, we might use the Terraform provider to manage Vault itself. And so when we talk about app integration, there's sort of two possible ways to do it, right? The app could be Vault aware, right? Meaning it's using some sort of native client library, right? The SDK, something like that, to natively interact with Vault's API. This is the sort of safest approach, right? Because our secrets are only in memory. They're going direct between the application and Vault. There's nothing intermediating that. The downside is it's high touch, right? You don't have to want to necessarily retool all of your applications to know about Vault. In some cases, we might be using libraries, right, like Rails or Spring or things like that, where the libraries are actually integrated. So if you're using Spring, right, there's like two or three annotations you just add, the framework sort of handles the rest of the vault integration. Right? Similar sort of things exist for big frameworks like uh, Rails and Django and things like that. The other side is like, what if we're vault oblivious? Right? Our application isn't integrated with vault. We don't want to integrate it with vault. And there's kind of a few different ways of doing this, right? One sort of very common pattern is you templatize the configuration into it, right? Meaning, if I like to have, let's say, a standard Rails app, it's reading its config file from a YAML file on start, all I really need to do is make sure the username and password are in that YAML file by the time the app starts, right? And so this is what console template will let us do, is instead of putting the username and password in the template, what we're really managing is, a, uh, I'm sorry, into the config file, we manage a template where we're sort of filling in a variable and saying, okay, here's where you'd fill in the username, here's where you fill in the password. And then right before the app starts, console template will interact with Vault, generate, you know, execute the template, and then render out the config file that has the actual credentials in it. And then the application starts, and it reads its credentials from the config file like normal, right? And then as Vault needs to rotate these credentials because they're time-bounded, it will re-render the template and tell the application to restart or reload, right? So in this way, the app is just reading its config file like normal. It's sort of none the wiser where these things are coming from. Right? There's an equivalent tool called an env console that injects it as an environment variable. So if our app is used to reading you know, MySQL user, MySQL password as an mvar, you can sort of inject it as an mvar right before the app starts, right? similar pattern. The other kind of approaches are platform integrations with things like Nomad and Kubernetes, right? So if we're using one of these platforms, there's integrations for them that allow the secrets to sort of be materialized just in time before the application. So the app boots, it just reads from, you know, it's local slash secret folder, like normal, it doesn't really know how those secrets got there, but behind the scenes they were sort of injected from Vault, right? Lastly, there's also a Vault agent that you can actually run as sort of a sidecar, sort of a proxy to the application that can simplify some of these flows in terms of logging into Vault, generating credentials, getting them on disk, et cetera, vending them out. So there's a few of these different patterns in terms of depending on environment and platform that you need to sort of make it Vault oblivious, uh, but still get those credentials. So sort of in brief, a uh, quick summary, right? So we step back and kind of think about the key use cases. One is the secret management use case, which is really username, passwords, API keys, certificates. How do we get those things out of being sort of sprawled everywhere all over this state and living in kind of a central place with Vault? The next one, and this is largely done in a way that's oblivious generally to applications. It's done at kind of an infrastructure level. First is the kind of middle use case is Vault as sort of a piece of security middleware. Right? You provide it to developers and say, hey, if you're hashing passwords or encrypting data or generating certificates to talk to another service or getting a job for authentication, this is a middleware your app integrates with that allows it to you know, more easily do all of those things instead of you implementing it and probably getting the code to run, right? And then the last one is really how do we think about privilege access management? How do our human operators get access to it? But you know, another way to think about it is from the, you know, we call it privilege access management if it's people doing it. If it's machines doing it, it's really a notion of identity broker, right? What if I have an app that's running on-premise that it's authenticating with Active Directory, but it needs to fetch an Amazon credential? Right. How do I broker that difference and say, great, I'm going to translate your Active Directory credential, which you have, to an Amazon token, which you need, so that you can go interface with S3, right? And so that sort of would fall kind of, I guess, in that third category as well as that sort of notion of brokering of identity between these different platforms. How does a thing on Amazon get a credential to talk to Azure or vice versa or you know, Kubernetes or et cetera, et cetera, right? We need to be able to translate one form of identity for a different form. That said, there's a whole lot of things we're going to cover, right? There's a lot of depth in the specific dynamic secret backend that we really didn't touch at all, except for a very sort of conceptual level. Uh, there's an ability for Vault to do SSH brokering. So sort of a classic pattern you see is there's the one PEM key to rule the whole estate, right? If you have the PEM, you can SSH into whatever you want, uh, whenever you want, right? 
Uh, and so Vault looks at that and says, yeah, that's actually probably a bad model, right? You should actually do something more akin to dynamic secrets where Vault has the master pen, but you pre-auth against it and say, hey, I'm, I want to SSH to you know, machine 47, and he says, great, here's a cert valid for the next five minutes, right? Here's a key you can use. So that same sort of how do I get to non-repudiation well, I know it goes arm on to that machine in this time period, right? As opposed to, well, everyone has it now, right? Uh, and then things like service account rotation, right? So if we aren't able to do dynamic generation, right? For things like Active Directory, you can still manage service accounts. Things like TOTP and MFA code. So if we want to provide like a TOTP login mechanism, but we don't want our app to implement it itself, you, know, you can offload things like TOTP and MFA to Vault. And much more, right? Vault, as I said, is really the best way to think about it is it's a security platform. Once you have that kind of core, the three A's in place, there's all of these different kind of functions that exist on top of the system. That's all I have. Thank you guys so much for listening, and uh, we'll sort of open it up to Q and A. Thanks. If we can get a line, maybe going either through here. Uh, yeah, let's go. Do you have a Kerberos authentication already built in, or do you need that provided as a plugin? It's coming. And it's coming as a plugin. There we go. <laughs> but it's coming in, the, I think, uh, either the next release or the shortly after. And they're working on it as we speak, so. Okay, so we're come from a place where we're like, all Kerberos all the time. It's a financial, isn't it? You gave me one hint. <laughs> Relate in way in way with Ansible Vault or they're completely just an overload of the name or yeah super good question so Vault turns out to be like both the best and worst name uh, for security product because everything is called Vault so clearly not that bad of a name uh, but it's a bad name that everything's called Vault uh, so Ansible Vault is really a much 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 smaller in scope than what Vault does it's really just about you know how does Ansible store a few key secrets like the SSH key needs to be able to SSH in to, to actually do its administration. In practice, Ansible has a native integration with HashiCorp Vault. So for a more sophisticated sort of actual secret management use cases, what you tend to see is that Ansible Vault is still used in a very minimal capacity, but it's largely then just being used to then contact them to the HashiCorp Vault and, and do secret management. Yeah. Question? Well, I know Vault's super simple, so you know, I didn't expect many questions. It's pretty straightforward. But, uh, <laughs> Do you have experience like taking Existing applications that do whatever they do for secrets and change them so they can use vaults, like how complicated that is? Yeah, super good question. It's sort of the application onboarding question. And uh, yes, I'd say we go through it with all of our customers. Um, you know, I think the transition is we're moving from a world which is relatively undisciplined, I would say, right? So very rare do you go into an organization and say, hey, all of the apps are already doing secret management and we're just moving from vault or from something else to vault, right? It's usually like Secrets sprawled everywhere, things are hard coded everywhere, and now we're trying to impose discipline, right? Bring order to chaos. And so, really, what it becomes about is you have to stand on Vault, have it as sort of central service that then you expose to all of your application teams, but then it is a one at a time thing, right? Is it is, you know, new applications, great, those are easier, right? You don't have to do the damage. But then the old ones, it's about training the application teams, and there's some amount of carrot and some amount of stick uh, with security teams uh, to sort of get them to go through that process. There's really no good answer. I think you have to go through and understand what did they hard code, you know, what credentials does it actually need, sort of surface those and then onboard the applications. Uh, there's no substitute for doing the work here, unfortunately. Uh, question about the Chicolac problem. How does the application authenticate the vault? Yeah, yeah. Does it hold the secret? Yeah. Is it config file? Super good question. So that's that sort of secret zero question, right? Which like that initial secret that you present to Vault, where does it come from, right? And there's really two fundamental answers to it, right? One fundamental answer is platform integration, right? So in the case of Amazon, Azure, you know, Kubernetes, whatever, like a, a platform, they're going to provide some underlying thing to the workflow, right? In Kubernetes case, it's a signed shot. In Amazon's case, it's an IAM token. Then that is what gets forwarded to Vault. Vault then has a series of authentication plugins that are aware of the platform. Right, so there's a native integration with you know, Kubernetes, with AWS, et cetera, et cetera. So then we can take the JOT or the IAM token and go back and say, hey, tell me about the thing that's connecting to me. Right? And I can use that to then be a, figure out, okay, this is a web server, this is an API server, or no, this is just some random thing. Like, no, you're not able to log in. So that's the platform integration story. The other fundamental answer is, what if I don't have a platform? Right? It's bare metal, it's VMware, you know, whatever. I don't have a thing that's being auto-provided to me. 
And then the analogy I like to use is it's sort of like HR, right? So it's the first day I show up at HashiCorp, like I don't have my initial login credential, but yeah, I work for the company, I need one, right? So HR meets you and says, okay, great, it's your start day, you know, this picture looks like you, I expected you to be here, whatever, whatever. Here's your first credential. And the first thing that happens when you log in says, rotate your password, right? So in that sense, the HR person was what you call a trusted orchestrator, right? They're trusted on behalf of the business. And so that person could run wild and go create 50 credentials and go log in as one of those credentials because they know it, right? But you're trusting that they won't, you know, mostly because they're probably fired, right? Uh, and so they're an agent of the of the sort of the business. And in the same sense, you can have that sort of trusted orchestrator model, something like Terraform, whether it's Ansible, whether it's Terraform, you know, whether it's you know some other system. You'd have a system that's logged in already and say, great, go provision a new VM that should be a web server, get a one-time use credential from Vault and inject that into the new VM that you just booted. Right? So the new VM kind of like, you know, Terraform in that case acted as the HR person. Here's the one-time credential. The first time you log in Vault, you, you rotate it and move on to a different in that sense, you've been securely introduced into the cluster, right? So those are the two kind of fundamental answers. You have a different shapes of trusted orchestrator, but you know, kind of same flow, and you have different shapes of platform integration, but those are your two fundamental answers. Final question: What is that you see in the field? Most commonly? What is it? The what? What scenario do you see in the field? Oh, so uh, what do you see most commonly? Zero, like. It's uh, it, it just totally depends on uh, the platform you're on. Right, like if you're all in, on, you know, if you're on AWS, you're going to use the AWS integration. If you're on-prem with Kubernetes, you use the Kubernetes integration. If you're on VMware, you're going to use a trusted orchestrator integration. So it just it's super, super dependent on what platform you're running on. Hey, Armin. great presentation, by the way. I see a lot of your whiteboard sessions on YouTube. So <laughs> that's great. My question is, uh, you didn't really, you just kind of touched on it, but you didn't really go into too much with the uh, database replication as far as like primary, secondary, I have an interest in fail over multiple regions. So I was just curious, is it more of like a federated database or how does it, like how does one master? Uh, yeah, okay, replication? sure. Yeah, so the replication exists on, the, on our enterprise product. At the core of which is your primary site is the source of truth, and then all of your secondaries are Full mirrors or partial mirrors. So if you have, you know, for some, you know, GDPR reason, you're saying maybe I don't mirror that data to Germany or that data should leave France, whatever. You might do a partial mirroring. But in general, you have, you know, mirrors on the secondary sites, uh, and they're basically doing sort of real-time async replication. So if I do a write against any of the sites, right, they will forward it back to the primary. Wait till the primary acknowledges it. Wait until that sort of update propagates to the site, and then acknowledge back to the caller that yep, your write just took place, right, and we've, we've mirrored it down. Uh, in the case of a read, in general, we can service those from the secondary site. So if a read operation comes into a secondary site, it doesn't need a call back home to the primary. Right? So in that sense, if we lose WAN connectivity or primaries down or whatever, right, read operations can continue to function. If we try and modify a policy or modify a secret, we'll get an error that we can't reach the primary. Uh, so it gives us a story that's sort of highly available. Right? And then you have to think about things like encryption really is a read. It's kind of weird to think about it that way, but if I'm encrypting and decrypting data, I'm reading the underlying encryption key to do that operation, not writing anything at all. So even things like data protection use cases continue to function, uh, even if I can't get to my primary officer. Hello, hi. Um, are there other like, vault um, common anti-patterns or do you see like, people using it in ways it wasn't intended that like you would caution people to watch out for before they start like some endeavor with it? It's not a database. <laughs> That's, I think, the most common uh, common failure mode is we'll come and be like, well, we tried to write 20 million records to Vault. And you're like, why? Like, you're like, oh, it's convenient. It's a key value store. It's encrypted. Now we don't have to deal with it, right? Um, that will get you into sort of tricky situations quickly, right? Especially once you get into sort of like replicated setups where you're really starting to put pressure on the system's ability to replicate data and things like that. That's a big anti-pattern. The other big anti-pattern is you know, any security product is only as good as its configuration, right? So it's like, great, you can have the most bug-free, perfect, high-performance firewall in the world. If your rule is allow all to allow all, it doesn't matter how good the firewall is, right? And so the other pattern you end up seeing is like, oh, well, we'll just give every user root access to bulk. Well, okay, well, great. Like, yeah, it's good that at least you have centralization, but there's no separation of access. There's no least privilege, right? Like, no non-repudiation, right? So you. You have to actually pay some attention as you configure the system to, to, to make sure it's secure. Thank you. Yeah. 
So it's not a transaction manager, but um, in most situations we deal with, we need to like basically use it like a um, online decision making system where you have product query stuff mm -hmm. into the, the underlying store. Uh -huh. So do you see providing anything like that? Because we've had cases where we needed to kind of query out and figure out given this out to X number of people or right, right. they configured it. So like tagging the secrets or providing some sort of other Okay, like, I see what you're saying. Sort of like almost like metadata reporting type yeah. capabilities. Yes. Yeah, so because Vault tracks all the leases, you can actually interrogate the system and say, hey, tell me about all the secrets you've given out for MySQL or tell me about all the secrets you know, for the Postgres database or whatever. So you can't actually interrogate it for that sort of metadata. And that's why it's there so that you can do things like replication. You do it on the you do it on what? You do it on the No, 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 you can do it online against Vault because it keeps all the lease information online. Okay. okay yeah. If you need to do more sophisticated forensics on things that are maybe leases that are expired or things like that, then you have to go to the audit trail. Mm -hmm. For things that are sort of active and still online, you can go to Vault and it has all the metadata as sort of online. Oh, cool. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Questions? Great questions. I, I have one question. Uh, in regards to multi data wait, centers wait. deployment, okay. Uh, for multi data centers deployment, so I just want you to comment a little bit in terms of the the enterprise version and the the, the open source one. Yep. Just which are the limitations when you will get to the point where oh I I should go with the enterprise because now I have kind of trade off things like that. Sure. So almost everything we talked about, actually pretty much everything we talked about is open source. The real distinction where you start hitting those kind of boundary points is when you start getting into different types of multi-data center operations, right? So if I have two data centers and I want a DR site, right? I want a, a, a hot DR backup site, that's a feature of enterprise. If I want to do multi-data center replication and sort of filter what data goes where, that's an enterprise capability. Um, some of the stuff we also run into on the encryption of the server side is we have users who want to push 100,000 transactions a second in terms of encrypt decrypt. Uh, and there's limits to how far one vault can scale. It can go pretty far, but not that far. And so there's some, some enhancements that depend on the replication subsystem to do uh, what we call performance standbys. So typically, vaults in an active passive model. Uh, so if I have three vaults in a cluster, one's active, the other two are sort of just standing by in case something fails, versus with performance standbys those things can do cryptographic acceleration. So if I have a huge volume of sign, verify, encrypt, decrypt, that kind of stuff, I want to be able to run maybe one primary and 5, 10, 20 standbys and to be able to accelerate the amount of crypto I can do per second. Uh, so some of those end up being kind of the key use cases, HSM integration, uh, we have a policy as code framework we call Sentinel that's part of it. Um, I'm sure there's other things that if I did a better job on uh, retail marketing, I would know. Um, but those are, I think, the core essence of it. All right, uh, another round of applause for Arm. Thank you very much, folks, in uh, sweaters and t-shirts right now that might also be able to answer questions. And uh, we'll be at the cupping room uh, on West Broadway. So, talk more. Thanks all.